morning. It is good to see you here this morning and good to be a part of Belmont Baptist Church gathering. And if you're watching online, thank you so much for watching and uh, being part of this service. Uh, I'm excited, as always, I can tell you I'm excited uh, about what God is doing among us as a people and what God's going to do for us today as we talk about uh, another part of the story. Now, before I get started, I want to, to remind you we've got a men's conference coming up uh, in a few weeks. And men, just sign up for that. $10. It will be the best $10 you'll spend uh, in the next few weeks. Uh, you will enjoy what's going to take place and what we talk about and, um, and just being together. Um, and also, Easter is coming up next week, or not next week, but the next week. And uh, I'm excited about that. It is. Uh, we didn't get to have Easter service together last year, so this year we're going to be able to do that again, and I'm excited about it, so remember that, and uh, remember each other as we think about moving forward, uh, remember to pray for each other, care for each other, and then we're going to get into the book of Numbers this morning, and I am, ex yes, I said I was excited, but it is a rough book. Uh, it's part of the story, though part of the whole story and it's a rough book because it being the book of numbers God numbers the people twice he has them number the people right when they get out of captivity so so Israel's in captivity for 400 years God uh, uh, does 10 plagues and they get Israel or Egypt's like please get out you are not slaves anymore please leave so they do live leave and they got to go through a desert a wilderness to get to the land that God had promised them. So they're in the middle right here in this wilderness. Well, God wants to number the people. In, in, in the book of Leviticus, he gives them laws. He gives them a way to live. This is how you're supposed to live. And as he's numbering them, he gets the number. Then he numbers the people 40 years later. So he numbers them when they first get out. Then he numbers the people 40 years later. Now, the reason he does that is because God's way of living, Israel did not accept. And so God had to judge them. And in his judgment, he, when he numbered the people before and after, it showed that there were over 600,000 men that died in a 40-year period of the Israelites. And it was because of something that they had done. And they had to wander in the wilderness for 40 years. Years You've heard that before, wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. Here's the thing is that they were, they were satisfied with just enough. Just enough, we, we, if we could just be provided just enough. But God wanted them to have more than enough, but they were unwilling to do what it took to get there. So to get that, all that story, backdrop of numbers into our life, I want to ask this question. What is one of the worst feelings that you can ever have in your life? One of the worst feelings. For me, it's getting caught. I remember growing up, the worst feeling in the world was to get caught doing something I wasn't supposed to do. It's just, it's just a feeling. It's like, oh, man, because you, 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 the person now knows, and, 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 and then you got to go through just the sick feeling of getting caught, and then you got to figure out what you're going to do because you're caught. It's not what it looks like. Well, yes, it is. It's exactly what it looks like. And so you go through this period of, uh, of sin, basically, is I've done wrong, and now I'm caught. Here's the problem. Now listen very carefully. Here's the problem is, you know, when, when my parents would catch me uh, in a lie or they would catch me doing things that I wasn't supposed to do, it would make me feel that way. But we have to realize this, that God always catches us because he already knows what's happening in our life. It was like Adam and Eve sinned in the garden and God shows up and is like, Adam, what's up, man? All through our lives, we have to realize that it's not that we're trying to keep from getting caught. When we are in the presence of God, which we always are, we're always caught. And here's the thing is we have to live with being caught. We have to live with the shame and the guilt. And what comes to place, what, what happens when we have shame is that we feel bad about ourselves. Like I'm not worthy, I'm less so here's what we do. This is a coping mechanism for shame. 
This is what Adam and Eve did. It's what the Israelites did. A coping mechanism for shame is to blame others. That is a coping mechanism. It's not my fault. I mean, somebody else's fault. They made me do it. We're always blaming. And then it comes down to this always. A coping mechanism for shame is to blame the rules. Well, those rules are stupid anyway. I mean, you shouldn't. I mean, we can do that. I mean, that's just dumb that we can't do that. And so we have found, we even try to find arguments for why God is wrong in his rules. Because we got caught disobeying his rules. And so the guilt and shame comes in our lives. I, I know that you felt that because you are a human. You are a sinner. You have sinned in your life. And it's only by the blood of Jesus Christ that you are a Christ follower. It's not because you've been good. Every one of us have been caught. And we may, some of you may be in that state right now where you're like, you know what, I, I'm feeling very bad because of something I'm doing and I'm trying to, trying to work it out. Or it may be that you've been in a position where you thought, you know what, I've been caught even by a person or by God and, and I'm feeling the shame of it. I'm feeling like the, that I, I don't know if God loves me anymore. I've been too bad. I've not been good enough for God to move in me. And so we come to the book of Numbers and that's exactly what is happening over and over and over again. Well, the people really don't realize it, but we, I think numbers can help us realize what it's like to live in the desert. Let me, let me read this and, and, and give a few, a few notes backdrop in, in Numbers 14. Let me back up just a little bit. And this, this is tough to swallow. This really is because God is, is who he is and, and he's not going to change. So the Israelites came out they complained when they got to the Red Sea. They were running, and they got to the Red Sea. The Egyptians said, leave, and so they did. But, the, but Pharaoh was like, you know what? I'm going to go back and kill them. I'm going to go back and get them. So he just had this harebrained idea that he's going to go get the Israelites again. Well, they were at the Red Sea in the front and the e Egyptians in the back, and they were complaining about, well, we're just here to die. And so what God did is Mo had Moses to, uh, to put his staff into the Red Sea. And then the water split. They crossed the Red Sea. The waters came back in as the Egyptians would come through and drown them. Came through and drown them. Next thing that happens is, is that they get into a mountain. And Moses is up on the mountain. And the people start complaining again and saying, well, Moses has left us. You know, he's, just, he's nowhere to be found. And so, so they make a golden calf. To worship the golden calf and dance around it and, and, and go back to their Egyptian roots of where they were in Egypt and, and dance around the calf. And it was part, even part of the things that they had seen of other countries and other places, nations. And Moses comes down, he's mad. And he's like, what have y'all done? Well, God even said, well, I'll just make another people for you. And Moses is like, no, please don't. So then we come again, and it's in Numbers chapter 11, they begin to complain after God spares them, he gives them a tabernacle. He gives them all of the things that they're going to need to be able to live the life that God wanted them to live. To get into the land of more than enough. Here's the thing. Is God wants you to live in a land that is more than enough. A land that is wonderful. A land that is, and I'm talking about in your heart, spiritually. He wants you to live in his presence. It's much better than anything else. But many times we are satisfied with living in our own selfishness. A land of just enough, where we just, we, we're in our own things that we want. So this is where the people were living in Numbers chapter 11. He says this, and the people complained in the hearing of the, of the Lord about their misfortunes. And, and basically that was in, in chapter 11, they were complaining because they didn't have a lot to eat. Then you get down to chapter number, uh, chapter number 12, and Moses and Aaron, who are, who are Moses' brother and sister, uh, Miriam and Aaron, they turn against Moses. And then people go with them. And then there are spies that are sent out into the land, spies that are sent out into the promised land. And these 12 spies go into the land into Canaan, and they come back with a report. Two of them said, hey, yeah, we want to go in. We really want to go in. Let's go. <laughs> I mean, we're ready to go because God, you promised us. God, you promised us that we can go in. So let us go in. 
And they're all excited. Well, ten of, the, ten of those spies came back and said, no, no, they're too big. They're, they're too bad. We can't, basically, we can't live in the land God promised for us. Basically this, we can't live the way God wants us to live. It's impossible. I can't do what God has called me to do. It's impossible. I can't do it. So they said, no, we're not going in. And so all of the people voted not to go in to the promised land. Well, God did not call for a vote, yet they voted. And God voted, and he said, everyone who said no, all the no votes of going in the promised land, will not get to go in at all. And he says, y'all are going to wander in this wilderness for 40 years, 40 years, wandering around for 40 years, until all of you who are over 20 years old die. Except for the two spies that went in, Caleb and Joshua. They were over 20 at the time. Now, can you imagine this? I want you to, to understand this. Imagine that you're under 20. And you're looking at the older generation who said, no, we can't go in. Imagine what you're thinking about the next generation. The ones that screwed it up for you. Imagine what you're thinking about them. Probably pretty mad. I would be. If I was 17 years old, 18 years old, ready to go in, and my mom and dad and all the people around me and all the old people said, no, we can't go in. I would be pretty mad. Imagine the older generation looking at the younger generation and how they felt. I don't want to, before we get too pious and put ourselves into the category of the under 20, (laughs) imagine what you would have done if you were in that position. And I know what I would have done. I know what I've already done is I have disobeyed God many, many times. And I have been in that older group. And I have looked at other people and felt their judgment. And I have looked at God and felt his judgment upon me. There have been times where I felt that I was wrong. I wasn't going to admit it to anybody. Or I may be trying to blame it on somebody else. But I knew I was wrong. And I was just trying to wash it away. And can you imagine living 40 years in the desert looking at that younger generation and saying, What are they thinking about us? Are they just waiting for us to die? How do you live with that? Here's what I want to get to, and I don't want to spend a whole lot of time with it. I just want you to ponder on this and think through this. How do you live with shame and guilt? How do you live in the desert with God? Because we can say all we want to. We can say, well, there's a dividing line, and I think this is right, and I think this is wrong. Well, if you look in the Bible, there are certain things that you shouldn't do, and there are certain things that you should do. And there are things that you are doing and not doing that that at times that you are just against God. That's our human nature, and we've got to get it right. Yes, we've got to get it right. But when we get it right, let me give you an illustration. When I was was a teenager, I did a couple of things, and my father was very disappointed in me. And I was disappointed in myself. I shouldn't have done it. And so as I got caught, talked to Dad, he gave me, he talked to me. For about five minutes, told me the consequences. I didn't like that. But I knew. I knew they were right. But here's what, what was happening. And this is, I think, where we are in the desert. And this is where we have, to, we have to settle with this. Is that there were about four or five days that I just didn't talk to Dad. Because I, I thought he was too ashamed of me. There were several days that, that I thought, you know, I, I didn't know how to approach it. I didn't know how to approach him. I didn't know how to approach... Life, I was just like, I'm so ashamed. I don't, I'm, I don't, please don't get this out. You know, you think, please don't tell anybody. I, I just, I just want this to go away, but it wouldn't go away. It was in my heart and it was a shame. And, and yes, I, I'd ask God to forgive me. God, would you please forgive me? But there was something in there that I just couldn't get. It was a hang up. And then dad came to me and he said, son, I still love you. I still love you. Now, when we live in that position of shame, And I know this is a very specific thing that I'm preaching on this morning. But this very specific thing is part of the whole story and it hits all of us. What do you do when you have been found out and found guilty? Well, how do you live that way? 
Here's what God said about these people in, in chapter 14, verse 26. Let's listen to what he said. And then how do you live this way? How do you live with how God felt? It says, And the Lord spoke to Moses and to Aaron, saying, How long shall this wicked generation grumble against me? I have heard the grumblings of the people of Israel, which they have grumbled against me. Man, he's mad. God's mad. Say to them, As I live, declares the Lord, what you have said in my hearing, I will do it to you. Your dead bodies shall fall to this in this wilderness, and all of your number listed in the census from 20 years old and upward who have grumbled against me, not one shall come into the land where I swore that I would make you dwell, except Caleb and Joshua. But your little ones who you, who you said would be, become a prey, I will bring in, and they shall know the land that you have rejected. But as for you... Your dead bodies shall fall in the wilderness, in this wilderness. Your children shall be shepherds in the wilderness forty years, and they and shall suffer for your faithlessness, until the last of your dead bodies lie in the wilderness, according to the number of the days in which you spied out the land, forty days, a year for each day. You shall bear your iniquity forty years, and you shall know my displeasure. I the Lord have spoken, surely this will I do to all this wicked. Uh, congregation who are gathered together against me in this wilderness they shall come to a full end and there they shall die Woo! that's tough that's tough to hear they didn't quit complaining and quit grumbling but that was tough to hear that's an old testament it's an Old Testament thing that was done to the Israelites. This is not something that I can say to you that God is telling you. No, no, I, I, but we can glean some things from this to understand that God does get angry. He does have, have wrath. He does, he, he does have things in his that, that are standards. And he says, I, there is a way I want you to live. And if you don't live that way, you will become guilty. You will become shame, uh, have a shameful heart. You, you, you will have consequences. There are all always consequences and so how do you live with the consequences now we'll talk about the forgiveness of God and the New Testament model that God set up for, through Jesus Christ but let's first of all get through this model that we understand that when you sin when you sin these are the things that are going to take place these are the things that are consistent that you can count on number one is if you sin and you live in shame, and you uh, whatever's happening in your life at this moment, and you, you're, you're living in shame, guilt, or you're trying to blame others. This is what the Israelites tried to do anyway. With whatever state you're in, when you're living in sin, there's one thing that's constant. God is still God. God is still God. He doesn't change for you. He doesn't change for me. Nothing changes with God. It means that he doesn't, he does not going to change anything. L listen to this in, in, uh, in chapter 23 of Numbers in verse 19. God is not a man that he should lie or a son of man that he should change, uh, that he should change his mind. He has, has he said and will he not do it or has he spoken and will he not fulfill it? It says God is still God. Now, there are several ways in which God is still God, and I just want you to get this in, in your mind. Number one, God is still holy. God still being God, no matter how much you sin, God is still set apart. So it means that he's not going to sweep it under the rug. He knows that, that statement, he knows my heart. Yes, he does, and he knows your heart just disappointed him. We have to understand that God has a way of living, and then when we measure our lives to that way of living, it does disgust us. And, and, and really, I know what I'm doing right now is really taking us down to a level to be like, how can we ever become Christians? I mean, how in the world? Because it's just, I mean, lying is, God's holy. God does not like lying, stealing, cheating, coveting. Murder, it, 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 the, the, those things. And then you go to attitudes. God doesn't like jealousy or envy, gossip. God doesn't like any of those things. And so when we talk about sin and living in the desert, living in that, that space in which we say, well, how does God feel? God is still holy, so we know how he feels. Then the second one, God is faithful. I want you to notice this in... In the, 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 rest of this, the rest of this passage, 
you, you notice that God still takes care of them. It's amazing, isn't it? Even though that they're going to die in the wilderness in 40 years, these, the, the older generation and then the young ones, he still takes care of them. He still provides food for them. He still provides shoes for them. God is still faithful. L- listen, if God were to do what he's supposed to do every time you sin, you would have died in that moment. You would have died in that moment. The first time you ever sinned, if God were to do what God is supposed to do, you would have died in that moment. But yet, he has grace. And he's still faithful. He's still faithful to take care of you. And he, he, Yes, he will, he, he will do things to bring you back to him. And I'm talking, about, uh, talking to Christ followers at the moment. This is what I'm talking, Christ followers. Listen, if you go to the side and you, you get your own life and then, and then you're caught by God and then that guilt and shame comes in and hopefully it's immediate, but, but God is still faithful. He's still faithful to you. He doesn't immediately kill all your family like the mafia would. He doesn't immediately. He doesn't immediately take away all of your all of your your possessions in your life. See, God is not spiteful in that He tries to beat you up just because He wants to. God is holy; therefore, everything He does is just and right. And so, in His holiness, He will treat you according to His faithfulness. That He is faithful. Everything He says, He will do. Everything that He does. It will be right. So God is faithful to you. Then there's the third one. He is present. Now we need to understand these things about God to get to the next, the next section. God is present. It means he's always there. If you're a follower of Christ and you have trusted Jesus Christ to be your Savior, Christ is still with you. He doesn't leave you. He will not forsake you. God is still there. Throughout the entire 40 years in the desert, God did not leave them. Though he threatened to, he said, I'm just going to leave. I'm just, I'm just going to leave. And Moses is like, no, please don't. Please don't leave. And I know it was a test for Moses. And, and it was God just revealing his heart and how disappointed he was. But, but he never left them. Listen, no matter what you've done in your life, God is not going to leave you if you're a follower of Christ. What he can do is he can take you out. But he's not going to leave you. He will always be ever present in your life. Faithful to you. Faithful to his word. Faithful to his promises to you. And then he is holy in pre- being present in your life. And sometimes I don't like that. That's the reason why, that's the reason why conviction comes is because he's holy. It's, it's because he's faithful and because he's present. He's always with me, so he's always going to tell me when I do something wrong. He's always going to make me feel bad for what I do wrong. It's almost like we say, God, would you leave me alone? And this is the thing about being a follower of Christ is no, God is not going to leave you alone. Ever. Now, he will people who are not his. People who are not his, he will leave them alone. If they reject him. That's why it's so important to be a follower of Christ. Is because you, even when you do wrong things, God is still present with you. It's important to have Jesus into your life so that you can have God present with you no matter what happens. And then the last one uh, of, of God is still God is he is powerful. God is still powerful in your life. He is powerful enough to do the miracles that need to be done in your life. And you're like, I'm in shame and I'm in the desert. Does God even love me? And and, and I feel the the intense guilt. And and, and is it possible that God would ever make this situation right? Maybe it it is that you have to confess to somebody. It, It might be that you have to, there are some things that you have to do to get through this. But God is powerful enough to see you through. And even if the Israelites are going to die after 40 years, God was powerful enough to fix the situation where he allowed those people to live 40 years to take care of the under 20. So he showed grace on the other 20, under 20 because, listen, we all think that God just loves us, but as I preached last week, God loves all of them. God loved the under 20 and the over 20. God loved all of them, and so he was going to use the over 20 for the youngers. God is powerful. So now that we know what, who God is, there's uh, a couple more things, and these are quick things. 
because I, I, I want this to sink in. I think our, the application and your reaction is more important than even the substance, uh, the deep substance, because there's so much to this. But because God is powerful, He is holy, He is present, because He is, God is still God, here's number two, cleansing is still available. Cleansing is still available. You see, those people, and even Moses reminded God of this, God, Moses reminded God, God, you said you would forgive. You said, and God did forgive. He said, I will pardon. They still can't go in, but I will pardon. And this is the understanding of what, where Jesus comes in, is that Jesus can cleanse us and Jesus can take care and, and heal us because of his blood on the cross. And if you would ask forgiveness of your sins, God will forgive you. Yes, there are always consequences to a lot of things that we do, but we can handle those things because we are forgiven. And even there are some consequences that we even escape because of the forgiveness of God. Love will cover a multitude of sins, including the love of God for us. Cleansing and covering a multitude of sins, meaning, meaning this is that Jesus Christ can forgive you of your sins and can cleanse you. And cleansing is still available for these people. They can still be the people of God. You see, God's not going, you cannot lose your salvation. You're not going to lose it. If you've sinned and you've d done horrible things against God, He's not giving up on you. And you can still be cleansed. Listen to these, these verses. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we have not sinned, we have made Him a liar and His word is not in us. It be, means this, is if you say, oh, I didn't sin, you have made God a liar, and the word is not in you. It means this, if you will admit that you have sinned, and you will admit that you have done wrong, you can go to God and say, God, I admit that this was sin, and I admit that this was wrong, and I want to get this right, and God will forgive you. And he's powerful enough to get you through it, even if it is a conflict in a relationship, even if it is something that you have made a mess with other people. He will forgive you. In Ephesians 1, 7, it says, In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of His grace. In Hebrews 8, 12, For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their lawless deeds. I will remember no more. And then Psalm 103, 12, As far as the east is from the west, so far has He removed our transgressions from us. Cleansing is always available to you. If you will bow before him, cleansing is available to you if you just, just bow. And so as they're living in the desert, they don't have to live in the desert in the guilt of those 40 years. You notice in this, for 40 years, the, the, the topic that God does for the rest of the Bible, the topic is not how wicked the people were. It, read, the, read it. I want you to read the, the instances in which God said, looks back at, the, at, the, uh, at him taking care of the Israelites. It is not that he's talking about their sin, they rebelled, they're terrible people. No, it's I took care of them. I took care of them. He doesn't, he doesn't keep bringing it up and keep hammering the sin. He keeps hammering the fact that I got you through it. I got you through it. When you sin, cleansing is Available, And you don't have to live in the guilt and the shame of your sin. You can move forward into what is next. And those, those people that were over 20, now if they were forgiven, yes, they could not get, go into the promised land. But what they could do, they didn't do this, but what they could have done is said, you know what, we're responsible for our children. We're going to help them get in. We're going to help them. Now they didn't do that, and they suffered the consequences. They still were there. Cleansing is still available. While you're in the desert and you're feeling shame, notice this. This is, this is something that's still there. Something that's still there. Not only is cleansing available and God is still God, but also obedience is still required. God never changed anything in the book of Numbers. Obedience is still required. In your life, whether you've sinned or not, obedience is still required. God still wants you to get back into obedience with him. He still wants you to do the sacrifices. He still wants you, because God understands this one thing is you're a human being. You are a human being. 
you are, and you are as rotten. You're, you know what? You're as rotten as your preacher is. We are as rotten, and we are. We can make the dumbest decisions. And, and I know God in his, his e- eternal and, and infinite genius looks down and is like, they are so dumb. They just are so dumb. And, we, and yes, we are, but that does not stop us from being able to get cleansing from God and being able to get back up and just do what God has required and commanded of us. You see, even Moses didn't get to go in. Even Moses did not get to go into the promised land because of his bad actions. But yet God still told Moses, I want you to speak to the people. I I want you to feed the people. I want you to help them. I want you to set up all the parameters. He, He still had jobs for us. He still had work for us. And no matter what you've done in your life, God's not through with you if you will find cleansing in his name. But as long as you live in the sin, you can't find obedience. And then you can't find righteousness with God. You can't find faithfulness nothing you, you, you have to you have to find the forgiveness of the faithful God even in your unfaithfulness and then the, this is the last one is the promised land is still in sight now <clears throat> when we're talking about God is still God cleansing still available obedience is still required now we get to the promised land is still in sight now here it is This is where we get into a New Testament. The Old Testament was for the Israelites, God speaking to them. But the the principle comes back to us and into the New Testament. Where in the Old Testament, God did not let them go into the promised land. Right? God did not let them go in. But there's something different for us on a spiritual level. Is that even though you have sinned, even though you have disappointed God, you are still, you are still living in hope you're still living in hope you see God was always going to take the people to the promised land he may have done it a different way than they thought he may have done but they were still going into the promised land and you know when God said this God said to Moses and I've just thought of this uh, you know a a few days ago just looking at it and it just came to me that, that God said I will make another people for you And Moses is like, please don't make another people for me. I mean, these people are fine. But do you know, in actuality, God actually did wait another generation, kill off the the old generation, older ones that had disobeyed, and he actually did rise up another people to go into the promised land. Nonetheless, they went in. Now, with Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, what God is saying, what God says to us, that while you're in the desert, while you're in that shameful position, God is still God. Cleansing is still available to you. Obedience is still required. And you still have hope. You have something the world doesn't have. And if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, and if you feel like that you don't have any hope, which means that when you do pass from this life to the next, do you know that you're going to go to heaven? Do you know that when you pass from this life to the next, will it be heaven or will it be hell? And you, you determine that through the blood of Jesus. If you have found forgiveness by the blood of Christ, then you are, you are going to the promised land. One of these days, you're going to go to the promise. You have hope. So, here it is. These people had messed up. We have messed up. We may lose some things because of sin and rebellion. And God may be harsh in his punishment while we live in the desert. But he has not abandoned his plan for us. God has not abandoned his plan for you. And so while you're living in the desert in shame and in guilt, just remember God's still God. Cleansing's still available. Obedience is still required. And you still have hope. Now if you forget all those things, you're going to live as a victim. You're going to live as, a, as someone who, who's going to blame. You're going to live as someone who will always look at God and say his rules are stupid. But if you can live that way, you will will begin to live in a land that is more than you ever expected. You will think, I deserve nothing, but God will restore your soul. If you're watching online, I know that you can 
if you need prayer or anything, you can uh, text to a number that's going to be on the screen. If you're in, in here as we go to the invitation, if you're in here, I want you to analyze your life, seek, search through your life, and see if there's anything that you need to confess to God. Anything within your life. And you may be living in a spot where you're like, man, I'm living in this desert, and I think God's abandoned me. I think he's, I th- I think he's and, and you're like, I hope, I hope I don't get caught. You're already caught. God already knows. And you're living in this desert, and God is begging, and he is pleading with you to just let it go. Confess it to who needs to be confessed to. It may just be God. It may be your neighbor. It may be somebody around you. Get back up and just go right back at what God has required for you, the obedience that God has required of you, which is just to be his follower, surrender to him. I don't know what you're dealing with in your life. If you want to use this stage up here to be your altar, a place that you can just pray to God, it's wide open. There's no judgment. I want to tell you this. I want Belmont to be a place where there's absolutely no judgment on you. If you've got something to confess, you're just like all of us. So if you need to pray somewhere, you, whatever you need to do, it's going to be good for your soul. Living in the desert with God. Bow before it. Lord, help us in these moments in Jesus' name.